Hello and welcome to our annual Mayo Clinic Florida virtual residency open house. My name is Liz Mauricio and I'm a neurologist here on campus as well as the program director for our adult neurology residency program. But tonight I'm going to be your host for the evening. We have a great lineup tonight featuring many leaders in education here on our Florida campus, and we hope to highlight what makes residency training here at Mayo Clinic in Florida so special. Now, before I introduce our first speaker, I want to share a few housekeeping items. Unfortunately, we'll probably won't have time for Q&A during the general session tonight, uh, but don't fear. Uh, if you have burning questions, you could try to uh, put them in the chat and we'll do our best to keep up with them in the moment. Uh, but if we don't get to all of them, please save them for the breakout sessions. Now, immediately following the general session tonight, you'll see a drop down menu at the bottom of the screen that it is kind of a cho choose your own adventure. So you'll pick the residency program of your interest to join their breakout session and learn more about that program. If you should get lost virtually, our media team will help you navigate, so don't fear. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, kick off the event uh, by introducing Dr. Margaret Johnson, Professor of Medicine, Pulmonary Critical Care Physician, and Dean of Education on our Mayo Clinic Florida campus. Dr. Johnson? Thank you, Dr. Mauricio. And I also welcome all of you to this virtual open house. It is such a pleasure to be with you here tonight. I thank you for joining us and I congratulate you. Getting to this point where you're about to choose a residency means you've accomplished some great things. Take a minute and pat yourself on the back. Congratulations. Choosing a residency is pretty exciting, but it can also be pretty darn overwhelming. Although it was a few hundred years ago when I had to choose my residency, I remember being pretty uncertain as to where I wanted to go. So I really invite you to use this opportunity tonight to learn more about Mayo Clinic in Florida and figure out, is this the place that fits you best? Is this where you should train? Why Mayo? Why should you consider Mayo? I've been here nearly 27 years. And for me, choosing Mayo was a very simple proposition. I chose Mayo because Mayo allows me to be my best. It allows me to optimize my potential. And more importantly, it allows me to be my best for my patients. In terms of training, Mayo Clinic, and specifically Mayo Clinic in Florida, will provide you as a resident all the opportunities that you need to optimize your potential. I think there's a commonly held misperception that here at Mayo, we only see the quote zebra cases. That's not the case. I can assure you as a trainee here, you'll see plenty of routine pathology, but also all sorts of interesting things you may not see anywhere else. As importantly, Mayo Clinic in Florida has the infrastructure, the support, and the people to allow you to thrive in your residency. We know residency is not easy, and we have what you need here to make the best of your residency experience and again, to optimize your potential. Mayo Clinic has been providing graduate medical education for over 160 years. Over time, I think we've gotten pretty darn good at it, and we would love to share our experience and our expertise and our enthusiasm for education with all of you. Before I leave you, I want to uh, 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 leave you with one final thought that often is overlooked. We all know that healthcare is in flux and there's a lot of competing factors in healthcare today. Mayo Clinic has always been and will remain a physician led organization. That means that you're training at an institution where all leaders are, leader, are people who have taken care of patients, 
who have put the needs of the patient first. And that ethos guides every decision that's made here as an institution. That may not seem terribly important on the surface, but when one thinks of the guiding principles of an institution, it is important as a trainee that those in leadership understand what goes on at the front line and provides, the, again, the best opportunity for you to optimize your potential. Thanks again for joining us tonight. I'm sure tonight is gonna to be very informative and I really hope this opportunity allows you to understand Mayo Clinic in Florida is the best fit for your training. I sure hope to see many of you here on our campus next year. Thank you, Dr. Mauricio, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Quinones, Professor of Neurosurgery, Chair of the Department of Neurosurgery, and Dean of Research on the Mayo, Florida campus. Dr. Quinones is going to share with us a little about research endeavors at Mayo, Florida, and opportunities for our trainees. Dr. Q? All right, let me see if I can share. He keeps trying to share another PowerPoint presentation. So I am going to try to do this right here and let's see if this works right here. Hold on one second. Apologies. I thought I had it all sorted out. And for whatever reason, he wants to open some other talk that I have right here. Let me try it again one more time. This is going to be the one that works. All right, can you see my presentation, Dr. Mauricio? We can, thank you. perfect. All right, great, excellent, thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you, Dr. Johnson. I was just listening to your talk, and I some of the things that I'm gonna tell you are gonna be more than anything echoing, you know, what Dr. Johnson just uh, said right now, and Dr. Mauricio has illustrated. They asked me to tell you a little bit about research and mentorship, and I think that it is difficult to conceive that those two things could ever be separate because they're so tight together, what we do. And everything at the end, it goes back to what Dr. Johnson said, the needs of the patient always come first and we wanna make a difference for our patients. So I'll tell you a little bit about our program. And uh, just today, I was just so excited. Some of the leaders, some of us went downtown to open our new community research center in which we are attempting, you know, and I say attempting when, with all honesty and being humble because we have so much to learn and so much to do in so little time, but we're attempting to build bridges with our community to do more research, to make sure that we continue to grow, not only as an institution in research and mentorship, but also in our bridges with the community. So it was inspiring to be there with Dr. Polaki and our entire team, Dr. Hill and our CEO, and thinking about the possibilities of research. I'll take you, this is about a 50 second video, okay? So this is a, something that I do for a lot of people who have not had a chance to visit our campus. Our campus is literally about half a mile away from the beach. I go for a run at least once a month right there, the river, that's the St. John's River. This is our campus right here that was uh, about a, a little bit over 35 years old. And it just began with a piece of land. That's our building, of course, we are proud of the places in which we, we work. Right next to the Mangerian right now, we're investing a lot of resources for the Integrated Oncology Building where we are building our uh, new proton and carbon therapy. You can actually see also the growth, that's the latest. We are almost doubling the size of our footprint for patient care. We're only one of the few hospitals in the United States that is top ranked, that is really less than 300 beds. I, I love our place uh, because it's like coming to Disneyland. I really think it's the most beautiful campus. That's the research and innovation. Those are the campuses together where we are experiencing a tremendous amount of growth. And it's a growth that is not only allowing us to dream of what tomorrow is going to be, but also giving our patients hope, which is very, very important for us. And I'll take you through that. But look at this amazing campus. I mean, when you look at this place and every morning, I feel like I need to pinch myself when I'm driving into campus and uh, seeing the amount of growth that we're experiencing in so many different ways. Our strategy is for growth in several areas that complement the entire Mayo system. We are having an, an experience and a tremendous amount of growth in artificial intelligence and discovery by biotherapeutics, 
the cancer center continues to be reshaped and reorganized. Our clinical trials is a priority for us. Our commercialization of all the innovations, patents, and a lot of the work that we do in our laboratories. And at the end of the day, one of our priorities has always been discovery sciences. And we never lose track of what is important for us, which is equity, inclusion, and diversity, which are part of the uh, fabric of this institution. The research at a glance, in 2022, since then, we have grown like another 11%. We have $148 million total in funding for doing research in a lot of different disciplines. We had over 2,100 publication, over 800 clinical trials, and almost about 640 stuff. Since then, we have experienced another growth in 2023. This is the breakdown for the Mayo Clinic in Florida. Out of those $148 million, about $51 million are the Mayo Clinic. We invest our own resources to be able to do more research. And a lot of that is also external. You can see almost $100 million from federal funding as well as foundation money. This is what allows us to keep pushing the frontiers of science and research. And who could have thought that a place like this, which was a piece of land, would grow to become such an amazing center. Most recently, we also acquired another 200 acres that has allowed us to plot what the place is going to look like in 30, 60, 90, 100 years from now. The growth is palpable. The energy is really something that inspires all of us. At the end of the day, this place is built on the experience of amazing mentors. You know, and I just wanted to show you a couple of slides of mentors, people who are making a difference, not only to the science, but also the people, the students, the residents, the scientists are mentoring. For instance, Dr. Tanner, Lily for Tanner, who just became the chair, also the neuroscience, a recent grant of over $40 million to discover new therapies for Alzheimer's disease. Keith Knudsen, who has been a leader in immunotherapy for breast cancers and many other cancers. Jorge Mayea, who is an amazing scientist and clinician who has been transforming transplant with lung perfusion as well as the use of mesenchymal stem cell therapy. Tai Yun Huang, who I have the privilege of working with him in the use of artificial intelligence and spatial omics in cancer. Then we go to Tania Gendron, who's been using biomarkers for brain disorders, Hava Zuber, who last year was recognized by NASA, I'm sorry, this year was recognized by NASA as a, a tremendous leader using mesenchymal stem cells up in space. Melissa Murray, who just became a full professor, also the most influential scientist of 2022 in our campus. And our campus, Bradley, who's an amazing orthopedic surgeon using regenerative techniques, obviously, for some of the science they do. And, of course, the priority to be engaged in the community. I link back to what I said at the beginning, these efforts are making us really feel not only connected, but it's giving us hope. Many times we talk about empowering ourselves to change the world. I couldn't finish the talk without at least telling you a little bit. Dr. Mauricio talked about the residency in neurology and neurosurgery. These are our four residents who have graduated. We're a few residents in where we only have one resident a year. Despite of that, these residents are doing amazing things. This year, we're going to end up with about 2,800 surgical cases, many, many, about 10 weekly CME conferences they attend, that they participate, a lot of presentations, a lot of research. Look at the number of publications, their influence on the field through the age index, the books, the journals they do, the teaching they do. is just truly really inspirational for us to see our residents. And no wonder this is one the only residency with only one resident a year that rank in the top 30 residents in the United States last year. This year actually was ranked at number 16. And you can see among amazing places to grow. So at the end of the day, we have a culture of learning, excellence, respect, and we like to have fun doing it. So I am very, very grateful. I echo the words of Dr. Mauricio and Dr. Johnson. Congratulations. You have done so much and you still have so much time to accomplish so much more. And we're so proud that you're here with us. Back to you, Dr. Mauricio. Thank you, Dr. Q. I love the videos and we <laughs> love working with our neurosurgery residents for sure. Next, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Leslie Simon, Chair of our Emergency Medicine Department, Medical Director of Experiential Learning, and Fellowship Director of our Medical Simulation Program. 
Dr. Simon is going to share with us some unique learning opportunities available for our trainees in our awesome Sim Center. Dr. Simon? Thank you for having me. And I'm going to see if I can get this going. Can you see my screen? Sure can. Fantastic. Thank you. So I, I'm excited to get to talk to you about my absolute favorite place on the Florida campus, which is our multidisciplinary scenario, simulation center. We opened in 2013 with the help of a very generous grant from the Weaver family when they sold the Jaguars team. Uh, part of the condition of the gift was that we were a resource not just for our own staff um, and learners, but also for the community. So when you come to the simulation center, you may see your colleagues and your friends, but you also may see um, the big brothers and big sisters or the Boy Scouts or the Special Forces military. So there are lots of different groups that train in our simulation center, making it a really exciting place. This is our procedural skills lab. This opened in 2018 and gave us another 2,500 square feet of procedural space. And I'm especially excited to let you know, we also just opened a skull base lab. It's a beautiful new facility. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture, but that opened just this month. So it, it's giving us some extra procedural space for uh, neurology, I'm sorry, neurosurgery and ENT. We have a task trainer room, which is filled with a treasure trove of all sorts of different simulators. When you're a student or a resident here, your badge will open this room. So if you wanna practice central lines or endoscopy or ultrasound at night or on the weekends, uh, you're welcome to this space. And these are just some other examples of uh, the task trainers and devices that we have for your use. This is the Mentis Angio Trainer. This is fairly new, uh, used predominantly by cardiology or interventional radiology, also for uh, neurosurgery. Uh, this is a sector table, and this was designed to be a virtual anatomy table, but we use it a bit differently here. This um, it will interface with our PAC system, so you can load uh, images from your own patients into this table and then look at them from all different directions, dissect them, uh, and you can also record from it for presentations. We just opened a virtual and augmented reality room as well, and we're looking at all sorts of different platforms and trialing different ways to look at education from a different lens. Uh, we do have a 3D printer in the simulation center as well. Um, there's several 3D printers on campus. So this one's smaller, but it will allow you to create uh, task trainers at the last minute if you decided you need something that we don't have. We have several different high fidelity simulators. This is Victoria. She's our pregnancy simulator and she can deliver breech babies and then have a postpartum hemorrhage and eclamptic seizure, then be intubated and then you can resuscitate the infant. Uh, we have several of these types of simulators in our, in our simulation center. We also have an incredibly talented group of uh, standardized patients, many of whom are actually professional actors who can portray patients or family members or members of the healthcare team. Uh, they really add to the learning experience because you can interact, them, interact with them in a way that you can't with a simulator. And they really enhance the learning for, for our, our, our learners. Uh, we have some truly talented moulage experts in our Sim Center who probably could work for Hollywood or at least Universal Studios. Uh, this is from a monkeypox simulation that I did for my staff in the emergency department just to make sure they knew what they were supposed to do when someone showed up with monkeypox. Uh, we also do a lot of interprofessional simulation. You know, we, that's how we work in, in real life. And so that's how we should train in the simulation center. And this is a picture from uh, an ECMO transport simulation. And this involved the critical care team, uh, the nursing staff, the uh, transport team, the perfusionists, uh, the respiratory therapy department, lots of moving parts and, and a really great way to make sure that we can do this type of thing safely. Uh, we do a lot of in situ simulation as well. And sometimes this is just what you would expect, you know, running a code on the ward or that sort of thing. But we also have some external partners that we've had a chance to work with. This is uh, some pictures from when we were working with SpaceX on the recovery boat that retrieves the Dragon capsule. We are an accredited simulation center through the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. Uh, we also offer a simulation fellowship. This is open to uh, physicians from all disciplines. Um, we've had fellows from emergency medicine, from critical care, from internal medicine, and, and several others. Um, this is a, a one-year fellowship, and we have up to two fellows at a time. 
if you're not quite ready to commit to a year, we also offer a resident elective, which has been really popular. And you can spend either two weeks or a month in the simulation center learning how to use simulation as a teaching tool. It's popular among rising chief residents, but we have a lot of other people who, who come in for, for different reasons. And we love having them in the Sim Center. We offer faculty development courses and also debriefing workshops. Uh, teaching with simulation is a little bit of a different skill. And so making sure that your faculty are ready to help you learn in the Sim Center is an important priority for us. Um, our, our website is uh, on the top here, as well as my email and uh, Jean Ritchie, who's our administrator for the Sim Center. If you have any questions that we can't get to during the, um, during the uh, question session, thank you so much. Uh, we're excited to have you on our campus and, and get to work with you. Thank you, Dr. Simon. I know our residents love to work in the Sim Center. We spend a lot of time there, uh, particularly during that transition to neurology between internal, year, internal medicine year and neurology. So we love it and we're very grateful. Up next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ivan Porter. Dr. Porter is a graduate of Mayo, Florida's Internal Medicine Residency Program and now serves as their Associate Program Director, as well as Vice Chair of the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension and as our Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Dr. Porter is going to share with you our mission to recruit, train, and retain a diverse workforce to better serve our community. That is correct. How's the screen look? Looking okay. good. Yep. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I also, I, I loop in a little bit of some of my other roles working in community engagement and access in this short discussion that we'll have. Um, so uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks for the invite. So glad you all are willing to join us this Tuesday evening. Um, I always uh, start with a little bit of a history of Jacksonville. Uh, there on your top right is Andrew Jackson, the namesake of Jacksonville. Uh, you also see a picture here on the left, which is from a uh, an exhibit from the Cummer Museum here in Jacksonville, uh, uh, speaking about the 150-year history of Jacksonville. And that uh, gentleman in the picture is the mayor at the time, uh, Hans Tansler, and that's a, an actress that acted at the Alhambra Theater, which is on Beach Boulevard here in Jacksonville still, if you're going to a dinner theater. Um, and it, basically celebrating the incorporation of Jacksonville, this the largest continent, continental U.S. city, maybe the second largest. I think there may have been some uh, reincorporations elsewhere, but one of the biggest land-wise cities in the United States. Um, and uh, again, there was discussions about whether or not this was an appropriate picture for the, for the history exhibit. And again, uh, the discussion was more about this is about documenting something in time, not about what's right or wrong or not about how people feel, but it's just a documented time. And I think that goes along with us here in Jacksonville. This was previously uh, Tamiqua territory, the Native Americans that who, uh, in 1829, Andrew uh, Jackson made a speech about the Indian Removal Act. And in 1830, that was passed. And then that started um, this forced removal of Native Americans from this area to uh, the other side of the uh, Mississippi River there. And uh, again, that's a picture there of uh, Gulliver, a Cherokee Indian from Swift's Gulliver's, um, uh, Gulliver's Trials. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it just goes to say that this gentleman, this uh, first military governor of Florida that never spent any time in Jacksonville based off of historic um, uh, records uh, is the namesake of the area. That probably doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people. Uh, but different people will have different perspectives to that. And I think it just uh, it's it's worthy of mentioning, in my opinion, uh, in the Office of Education, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, going along that blueprint that we have to recruit, train and retain um, uh, individuals of, of underrepresented backgrounds. Um, we in the school are take that mission to have targeted recruitment activities uh, to implement areas of the curriculum, which I'll discuss just shortly, and then also to work on diversifying our workforce to uh, represent the population. That population parity has been shown, that scientific evidence that that 
relates to better outcomes. Uh, so we need to do our part in creating that workforce if we're going to meet those goals. And part of that is through the curriculum, I Dare curriculum. We're talking about inclusion, diversity, anti-racism, and equity curriculum that it's based off these four pillars, these four competencies. Um, things that are personal, like what self-awareness for you, uh, how do you knowledge how do you integrate current knowledge of social justice into your personal beliefs, right? Interpersonal skills. So how do my personal biases affect the way I practice medicine or the way that I interact with my colleagues? How do the policies of an institution or the cultures at an institution uh, flavor the environment? And that's that's what we're trying to fix. I mean, that's my role as, as this assistant dean is really paying attention to the environment. And then again, society, how do my actions, my roles as a professional, how does that work in all of society? And how does that get back, back all the way down to that personal component? Uh, that personal reflection, the development of that perspective, I think is what takes us to where we need to be as a society. That takes us to how we can deliver the best healthcare and not doing so is, um, you know, it's a public health emergency. Um, this is a list of some of the pathway programs that uh, we in the uh, Graduate School of uh, Medical Education uh, work with some of our other colleagues to develop that early relationship um, and, and move forward again to try to diversify, diversify that workforce. That's the goal. We also sponsor and offer lecture series that are um, focused on key topics, disability, uh, obviously implicit bias. These are uh, two examples from last year. There was a course that started today um, with uh, uh, Dante King it's speaking about anti-racism as well. So again, we believe it's important to incorporate this into the curriculum so we can have those beliefs be a part of us and then we can, um, again, be in the best position to do the best for the most people. That sounds a lot like equity to me. Uh, we sponsor these events. Uh, you'll probably receive an invite for the DEI residency open house. Uh, we, uh, to everyone that interviews, we offer the ability to come back and have a specialized two-hour Zoom session, usually with a trainee panel. And we do that at all the levels. This year is the first year we've done it for medical students as well. I'm sure you've heard of other events like that. Uh, we'll, we'll be adding a fourth event that fits that as well. Um, and again, we have great attendance at these. They're great discussions. And again, we're just trying to add that perspective that some may not get. Um, Along all the other tasks that we have as a school that we've put into our operational plan for the year, we also work very closely with community engagement. And that's my point to end today is to talk just like Dr. Q had said earlier about this connection to the community that we're really trying to perfect. Uh, obviously, we have our own goals. We want to have uh, diverse recruitment trials, but that's not the same thing as community engagement. Really understanding what your community needs, really being able to advocate for your community is what we try to focus on. We send our residents to speak uh, at the Florida legislature. Uh, we're involved in many professional societies, but we also as a nonprofit hospital in Duval County are involved in the community health needs assessment, which is this ongoing uh, cyclical every three year survey of the community of what their needs are, what the outcomes are based off of data that's available to the hospitals. And then each of these hospital systems has to decide what can I help with? What are the priorities of me, Mayo Clinic, versus what are the priorities with Duval County and St. John's County? And how can I affect these social determinants of health and improve the healthcare in the community? That level of engagement is what is needed to make differences. If not, we end up with the same problems that aren't really addressed, and we're just over here doing our own thing. When we ask the community what's important to them, mental health, access and poverty are all at the top. This is like a ranking system based off of those uh, those community interactions and interviews that I spoke of, Fo key focus groups, areas, key focus group discussions, and also uh, assessment of the data. But again, uh, what Mayo Clinic specifically can do about poverty, uh, that's more of a difficult question. So what we do is we try to align those needs that are addressed with what we can do. And a lot of that is in the form of a community grant uh, program. And 
we give a lot of money to those grants and we try to prioritize those grants, the, the money that we hand out based off of alignment with these priorities that are within the community. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Similarly, when we do that community health needs assessment, we learn about the community. And it's important to know about the community that you're caring for. Duval in St. John's County, you can see some of the information here about the population in uh, 2022, but understanding the education levels of the population, understanding the finances of the populations that you care for help you deliver culturally competent care and care that's individualized where people are set up in the best way to be successful rather than just talking about ideas of what will be healthiest and what will provide the best care. It takes this level of scrutiny. It takes this level of involvement uh, in order to be as successful as we want to be. Uh, so in addition to that, I, I bring this up because Blue Zones, hopefully someone's heard of Blue Zones. You might have a Blue Zone in your area, but Mayo Clinic just joined uh, the commitment, the six-year commitment for Blue Zones Jacksonville, which really has this goal of just helping people live longer. Uh, so obviously that's that's by multiple methods and has many different aspects and components. I'd be happy to talk to anyone about that in the future. And if you're in Jacksonville, you'll learn about it because you know our mayor is very involved in Blue Zones and a lot of uh, other public institutions here as well. Um, lastly, I just want to loop in the uh, Learners Community Clinic at, at the Salzbacher Center, which is in Health Zone 1, one of the largest areas of needs in Duval County. Um, this is important for all of our trainee programs and our ability to be able to have service learning that's incorporated into our curriculum. And we have got large plans for all of our programs as we go. We have internal medicine, cardiology, uh, starting dermatology and pulmonology critical care in discussions right now. And again, we hope that this will be a, an avenue for all of our programs to be able to provide care to the community and have uh, more of that connection, help to facilitate research and uh, continue to improve the health of Duval County as a whole. Um, again, thank you for the ability to talk to you about this today. And um, again, thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Porter. Up next, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Bryn Dredla, Assistant Professor of Neurology, graduate of our Mayo Florida Neurology Residency Program, of which he is now one of our Associate Program Directors. Dr. Dredla is a consultant in the Department of Neurology as well as Sleep Medicine, and she serves as our faculty representative on the Trainee Wellbeing Subcommittee. Dr. Dredla is going to speak about resident well-being initiatives here on campus. Bryn? Thank you so much, Dr. Mauricio, and thank you all for being here. We're excited to have you on this evening. Um, for a full disclosure, I'm filling in for Dr. Tyler Van Bacor. That was sad um, that he wouldn't be able to come tonight, but he actually is our head chairman of the well-being. Um, and I'll have to give credit to Dr. Johnson because she really spearheaded well-being being a, an official kind of program here at Mayo Clinic. So Mayo, as you've heard thus far, has a very strong culture, starting back with the Mayo brothers at Rochester and then bringing it down to Florida about 35 years ago, like Dr. Q mentioned. And one thing that you'll see here is, you know, the Mayo way. You'll hear that a lot. And it always set ar around the needs of the patient comes first. Um, but we learned early on um, in our career that the needs of us have to be met before we can meet the needs of others, right? And Mayo has been uh, longstanding evaluating the needs of healthcare providers and the well-being of healthcare providers, even before well-being was a term you heard very often. And so we've had a long legacy of that. And there was always programs of well-being um, here amongst our staff, including ancillary staff, um, students, um, as well as consultants. Um, but we really wanted to try to formalize that and formalize a pathway um, to make real change, um, especially in areas that we thought perhaps might be lacking. And so um, the Wellbeing Council was started about five years ago. Um, like I mentioned, Dr. Vannabakor is the head of it. So he is actually our Wellbeing Advisor for all of the schools at Mayo Clinic. So that includes GME, but also our um, Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine, our graduate um, programs, our PhD programs, as well as our um, health and science um, delivery courses as well. So I'm the faculty representative, like Dr. Mauricio mentioned. Um, so I help advocate for all of you, soon to be in a year, um, for our residents and fellows. And so we have a council where we have representatives of not only staff, um, but of, of trainees. And so we have a nice diverse um, section of trainees. And we meet monthly to chat about what's the word on the street? How are we doing? What could we be doing better of? And um, basically advocate on your guys' behalf to leadership to get things done. 
important. And so, for example, um, things that we've done here at Mayo Clinic is such as advocating um, for a change in vacation policy. That was the most recent one that was quite a winner um, lately um, because we heard, hey, nationally, it's different, even though, yes, we are very lenient on our travel policy. Um, you guys have informed us, hey, we need better vacation. So that was a big effort enterprise wide that was done. Um, also, for example, we had heard that there wasn't enough lactation pods or access to computers while um, allowing, um, you know, uh, uh, trainees um, that might be um, new moms to be able to do that. So um, we're able to implement that as well. So just kind of ideas that came from trainees that we were able to actually um, work upon or just some examples that were done this last year. Um, but the main goal is to provide, um, like I said, a voice and programs um, and access to well-being. Um, each um, department, and you'll probably learn about um, during your breakout sessions, is very dedicated to well-being. Um, and each um, specialty uh, has their own area of interest. So, um, for example, in neurology, um, they do well-being retreats twice a year. I know in other programs, they do well-being days where they go down and um, partner with humanities and medicines to do some reflective writing, going to museums, kind of learning more about our colleagues that we work so closely to to help with bonding and building. Um, also, um, there's the Office of Wellness and Academic Support, which helps with how do I transition from med student life to resident life? How do I study now? How can I do time management? So we have coaching staff. We have have academic support and success staff um, that could walk you through if there's any difficulties there, as well as helping with accommodation of any disabilities um, or other medical issues. So if you need to go to the dentist, if we can be patients ourselves some days, so if we need to go to the doctor or we need to go to a mental health provider, um, we work with um, departments to get time away from um, your activities to do that. You don't have to take vacation time, um, you know, things of that nature and can do it discreetly. We also offer um, a whole separate mental health counseling. Um, so we offer an actual WellConnect program. So there's um, an app you could go to confidentially, even if you're off campus, so you don't have to be on campus to access those things as well as um, we have great um, networks in the community um, to get help assistance in that way. So as you can see, there's lots of layers to well-being, um, and we try to uh, encompass all of that. Um, the main thing is if you have ideas for future well-being things, we want to hear those, and we want to be able to take that serious. Because as um, Dr. Porter mentioned, we want to take um, a good environment and the well-being of our community, and we want to make sure we do the same for you guys um, as our trainees as well. So welcome, and thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Dredla. There, these are tremendous resources for not only in our learners, but for our program directors as well. So thanks a lot for sharing that. Next, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Emmanuel Gabriel. Dr. Gabriel is an assistant professor of surgery, and he's going to speak on the surgical innovations happening on our campus today. Hey, all right, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, so I actually am clerkship director for the medical students, so we have a lot of you guys here too. I really hope that you take a good look at us. I tell the residents every time, all the time that if I could go back in time, I would love to have applied here and come here from the Northeast uh, because it's a wonderful residency for general surgery. And I've been tasked to talk to you about innovation here. And these are the different departments or divisions within the Department of General Surgery. And it we can't cover everything, so I'll just kind of give you a broad highlight of things that are happening within our department. So we do have advanced GI and bariatrics as one of the divisions. There are robots everywhere. I've lost count of how many robots we have in the operating room at this point. We have SIs, XIs, we have the training consoles. These are two of our surgeons, Dr. Bowers and Dr. Ellie. They work very closely with Intuitive to develop new gadgets for them. Uh, this thing over here is a new magnetic laparoscopic J tube that Dr. Ellie, who's this surgeon over here has patented and is working to develop with Mayo Clinic Ventures to have a more streamlined way of putting uh, jejunostomy tubes in with minimal incisions. We have colorectal surgeons. Uh, this is our division of colorectal surgery. Uh, Dr. Murchia, he does this procedure, which many of you may not have seen or heard of. It's called PIPEC or pressurized intraperitoneal aerosolized chemotherapy. This is for patients with just really bad advanced uh, carcinomatosis within the abdominal cavity. They often have no other treatment options. And they insert these needles, they connect it to this pump device, and they basically fill the abdomen with pressurized gas. Uh, he is leading this nationwide. There's only actually three sites that do this procedure. 
This is something that I work with. It's a what we call an intravital microscope. So it allows us to look inside the patients while we're doing the surgery and characterize their blood vessels in real time. These are some of the pictures that we get of individual capillaries. And you can see individual red blood cells moving through these to help us try to quantify or predict how people, patients will respond to neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy. And this is something that uh, hopefully Dr. Q will actually start doing in the brain as well, look at brain tumors in real time, which has never been characterized. Uh, plastic surgery has a very, very robust uh, innovation and research. This is Dr. Forte. Uh, if you look him up, he probably published this somewhere between 60 to 80 papers in the last year, like per year. Uh, but he does a lot with what was talked about earlier in artificial intelligence. So they can integrate different AI algorithms and computer programs into apps for patients that can help streamline and troubleshoot different things that patients are having at home after hours when they can't reach their healthcare providers. That's one of the things he works with. But he also is a basic scientist. So he does things with stem cell regeneration. You can imagine with plastic surgery, sometimes it's hard to cover flaps or tissue after burns and things like that. Uh, so he grows stem cells in the lab and tries to uh, integrate them into mouse models and hopefully into patients as well. So I'm in the division of surgical oncology. We have a lot of innovation here. This is Dr. Jacob. He runs a cl many clinical trials, but one of the trials that he runs is on robotic nipple sparing mastectomies. It's just a handful of places across the country that are actually opening this trial. Uh, so using the robot in many different innovative types of ways. This is something that I do here. It's called breast cryoablation. Um, you might not see this at many places. It's not a kind of standard thing, especially for cancer. And what's nice about this procedure is that I do it, but we also work with our colleagues in interventional radiology uh, for more challenging cases. So there's a very nice collegial atmosphere here. This is again using that microscope that I showed you earlier to demonstrate blood vessels in patients with melanoma, not just the carcinomatosis or brain tumors, but other sites. And then of course with innovation, as Dr. Q mentioned, it goes really much hand in hand with research. So many of us have labs also where we try to correlate these clinical findings to the lab and then bring them back to the clinic. Uh, what's also nice about innovation here is uh, there's actually places uh, what's called Mayo Clinic Ventures, which helps physicians uh, establish businesses out of what they develop. Uh, there's different ways to get involved with the community. This is There's a program through the Georgia Tech College students where they come here and we go over there to help develop uh, projects. They basically lead the projects in, and use all of Georgia Tech's resources to help address clinical questions we have. I'm happy to say last year, my team won first place for biomedical sciences for a device that helps us strip cancer from the abdominal lining. Um, and here's a YouTube link if you want to see more about that project. So I keep mine short and sweet, just like the surgeries I try to do. And I will turn it back over to you, Dr. Mauricio. Thank you, Dr. Gabriel. I'm honored to introduce our next guest, Dr. Charles Bruce. Dr. Bruce is a professor of medicine and consultant in the Department of Cardiology. He serves as our Chief Innovation Officer, as well as the Enterprise Medical Director of the Center for Digital Health Innovation and Emerging Technology, as well as the Medical Director of our Mayo Clinic Innovation Exchange. Dr. Bruce is going to talk about some of the medical innovation initiatives on the Mayo, Florida campus. Thank you very much, Dr. Mauricio, and thank you very much, Dr. Johnson, and it is a tremendous honor and privilege to be able to speak with all of you. Uh, and to share with you uh, just the incredible opportunities that we have at Mayo Clinic in Florida to, to really spur innovation, attract, retain, and polish talent. We've curated an unbelievable ecosystem of resources that help bring ideas to benefit people as quickly as possible. And we have an amazing asset called the Mayo Clinic Innovation Exchange that basically serves to, is in service of the idea. Uh, we don't mind whether an idea occurs inside of Mayo Clinic or outside of Mayo Clinic, maybe at a startup in Spain or a rural, a, a rural community in Africa. We're just interested in taking that idea and connecting it to the next best resource that it needs so it can move quicker on its pathway to reality, so it can benefit people as quickly as possible. Uh, Mayo has a very rich history of innovation, dating back to 1929 when uh, Kendall and Hench discovered cortisone. Um, some of you may be aware of Cologuard, uh, but now when you turn 45, you don't have to have a colonoscopy. 
Rather, you can benefit from a Mayo Clinic invention uh, that basically detects DNA from a, a, a precancerous polyp that, that prevents you from having to undergo um, a, a colon screening colonoscopy. There are many other uh, opportunities that, that, that we have available. You've heard some already mentioned, specifically the opportunity for the top undergraduate students of Georgia Tech, for example, and Florida State University, to be embedded in our clinical practice with a Mayo Clinic staff member, including our residents, uh, who can then identify a problem and then over the 16 week time frame, figure out a solution, build an early prototype, and then that can potentially gender, engender an opportunity for patenting and commercialization. We've had 48 cohorts already go through this program. It's just a ter tremendous opportunity to, to, uh, to harness the talent uh, and the creativity of, of our staff. So I, I encourage you all to, to engage with the Mayo Clinic Innovation Exchange. Uh, you can look at us uh, online, uh, but would be very excited to, to, um, to, to engage with you, uh, and particularly those of you who are interested in, in inventions and innovations. Thank you, Dr. Bruce. And now if anyone follows me on Twitter or Instagram, I've been bragging about one of our neurology residents, Dr. Ali, who has been paired with one of these Georgia Tech engineers to uh, design a prototype type for one of his ideas. So we're, we're living proof of that program and we're really excited about uh, Dr. Ali's project coming up. All right, well, for the grand finale of our general session, I introduce you to our chief medical resident, Dr. Aman Bali, and our chief surgical resident, Dr. Jamie Kaplan. They're going to share with you a little bit about what it's like to be a resident here on campus and what it's like uh, to live in Jacksonville. Take it away. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, and we see your slides. I've seen too. my slides. Perfect. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm joined by Jamie. I'm the chief internal medicine resident, and she's the chief surgical one. And I think we have the pleasure of you know doing the fun part of the day where we just show you guys resident life, basically. So to start off with, I think one of the things that's kind of lost with these uh, you know virtual presentations is just seeing Mayo's campus and. I can say that it's one of the most beautiful hospital campuses and, you know, campuses in general that I've ever seen. In terms of the facilities, everything is kept uh, pristine and very clean. Uh, we have a variety of, you know, newly uh, built uh, buildings, and there's also new construction that's always happening on campus to create new spaces for our learning and training as well. Uh, over here, I've shown some uh, pictures of some of the various facilities that include resident lounges and workspaces, as well as, you know, separate meeting rooms and clinics. Uh, the training spaces can be divided up into these buildings you see on the screen, which uh, the Mayo Hospital is where, you know, all the inpatients reside. And besides that, there's uh, outpatient appointments that happen in the Canada building for primary care services and some of the surgical subspecialties, dermatology in addition, and Davis building for additional outpatient care and outpatient procedures. The Mangurian building houses a uh, neurosurgery, neurology, oncology, and then the Stabile building is kind of a, a, a more administrative building and also has some diagnostic laboratories. And I think in about a year's time, we'll also have a gym on campus too, which is one of the things that if you come here, you might have to look forward to. Uh, this is a picture of one of the IMED workrooms, what that looks like. Uh, this is just a team going through their morning rounds and presentations. There's uh, individual workstations for every uh, trainee. And these, uh, at least on the internal medicine service, workrooms are newly remodeled. So that's something you guys have to look forward to as well. Uh, highlighting some uh, previous points made by Dr. Q about the, the training environment at Mayo, I think the collegiality of it extends not only to uh, you know, research and innovation, but also to just clinical practice in general. Uh, before I came to Mayo, I didn't really appreciate how, how much uh, value there is in coming to a place where everybody just wants to be there and looks forward to contributing to patient care and is just very good and dedicated to their job. I think when you kind of practice medicine in that environment, it just inspires you that much more. And it's just, you know, easy when everyone's on the same page, whether it be uh, the case manager, the nursing staff, the phlebotomist, uh, 
environmental services. It just makes uh, the work experience that much more enjoyable. Uh, I have some more pictures here that show uh, on the top left, one of the internal medicine teams, including myself rounding. Uh, I don't know why we we're all so happy in that moment, but I, think, I guess it's a normal day for us. Uh, one of the surgical teams can be seen on the right side. And then at the bottom, I think it was Valentine's Day. So everyone was wearing their, their Valentine's hearts on the cardiology service. Uh, so very fitting. So, uh, and this is a more recent picture, I guess. The, the previous pictures, all pe people were masked up. So here you can see post-COVID, uh, their smiling faces, just so you know they're not faking it. All right, and I'll pass it off to uh, Jamie. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amon. Um, so yes, I'm Jamie. I'm one of the chief surgical residents. So one thing that Dr. Simon mentioned earlier was the simulation center. I can't tell you enough how much time at least the surgical residents spend in here, but I'm assuming all the residents do. This is just one of a kind. It's open 24 seven. You can go in at any time you want. I know I've gone in when I was a junior on call overnight and it was a light night, I would just go in and like practice on the robot and practice suturing. So it's always available to you. As you can see here, there's a bunch of different suites that you can access. So you can do simulations with ICU patients, with operative patients, with emergency medicine um, situations. And then there's also control rooms and debriefing sessions so that once you go through it, then you can kind of go through how you did and uh, what you can improve upon. Um, we also do a lot of training sessions with medical students in the community. So actually over here in this left-hand corner, it was a AMWA session a few months ago where we had some surgeons and some residents help uh, teach suturing classes to medical students. So that's always fun. And we always have innovative um, procedures and such going on. So we have different reps come in and teach us how to use different tools that we can then use in the operating room or in different situations. So it's always a great time in there. We can go to the next slide. So <laughs> I would not be a resident if I didn't get to talk about food a little bit. Um, I don't want to, you know, say anything bad about Rochester, or Arizona, but I've, I've heard through the grapevine that Florida may have the best food. Um, but we really do have great uh, food here in the cafeteria. There's multiple different stations. You have the salad and soup station. Then you have the kind of daily menu on one side. You have sushi, you have poke bowls, and then you kind of have a rotating station every day. It's something different. You can have pad thai, uh, wings, fish. It just kind of changes up. And then you also can just grab and go if you uh, need something quickly. On the right hand side, this is actually in our Stabile building. So if you go up, um, there's a kind of another resident lounge that you can access. There's always a fully stocked fridge and you've got fruit and chips and sandwiches. So if you're just trying to grab something quick, you can get that. We also have a resident lounge in the main hospital building on the third floor. So again, you kind of grab and go uh, during the day as your schedule al allows. And then on the bottom left, this is actually some of our surgical team grabbing breakfast, which uh, is honestly not that common, but you know, surgical resident residents can get breakfast too. Um, so yeah, we actually have a really good food um, here. So definitely check that out if you come here. All right, so talking a little bit about research. So we all uh, are really, really fortunate to have the uh, attendings take so much time into what we hopefully get out of research. So we are not mandated to take any time off for our surgical residency. And I don't believe that's the case for other residencies as well. However, if you are interested in taking time off, that is definitely something that we can uh, help accomplish if that's something you're looking for. In terms of kind of specifics that Mayo offers, we do get five presentation trips annually. So if you're going and you have a poster presentation or a podium presentation, this is completely covered for you. You do not have to worry about any money. We get a Mayo credit card at the beginning of when you start residency. And that's what you put all of these uh, trip funds on, air, airfare, hotel, all of that. Uh, so you get five presentation trips annually. And then this actually has recently changed. So this is not as up to date as I'd hoped, but we actually get two attendance trips over five years if it's a five-year program. So for general surgery, it's a five-year program. So it used to be one attendance trip, but it's actually two. So that means even if you're not presenting any research whatsoever, it's just something, a conference you're interested in, 
the entire attendance trip will be covered for you to go and learn and network and all of all of the things that come with a conference trip. So you, we get two now. We also get media support services, biostatisticians. So really Mayo is looking to have you succeed with research. So even if you may not be trained in certain areas, there are people there that can help you with the stats and other parts of research. Uh, the other difference on this slide is it says 1750 per trip that actually has gone up recently. So um, I believe again, this is for everyone, but I know I can speak at least for the surgical residents. The trips now are 2550. So again, everything really should be covered when you're going on these trips to all of these different conferences. And then we also all get a designated laptop. So when you start residency here, you'll be given a laptop that you can use at home, which is great. I check on patients all the time when I'm at home. So it's really, really helpful with that. And then living in Jacksonville. So I have to say I was born and raised in Florida. Being able to come back to Florida was a dream come true. Being able to live literally a block from the beach, I can't even say. So uh, a lot of us live beachside. However, you can live pretty much anywhere in Jacksonville, even though based on land uh, surface area, it's an extremely large city. It really feels like a small city and it's very easy to get around. Uh, traffic really is not an issue getting to and from work. And um, it's just kind of really nice. It's local. It's very close to the airport if you're trying to travel to different places. And it's also really close to other places. So if you are trying to go to Orlando to Disney or you want to go over to Tampa for a weekend or even go up to Savannah, these are all cities that are really, really close and easy to get to. But Jacksonville itself, the weather is phenomenal. You get to live near the beach. If you like anything outdoors, it's a great city to be in. And honestly, I know we're not maybe New York City, but the food actually here is very, very good. So um, I'm very excited to have you guys kind of check out Jacksonville. And then in terms of yeah, affordable housing. So uh, I'll have maybe Amon touch on this a little bit as well. But from a surgical standpoint, a lot of us bought. It is very affordable to live here during residency. For us, it's a five-year program and it makes a lot of sense for us to buy. So the three um, of my class, we all bought. The class underneath us also all bought. Um, you can absolutely rent if that's what you're interested in, but just keep in mind, it is really affordable in Jacksonville to buy. Um, and you can see pictures up here. These are actual residents' homes with swimming pools and um, it, it's definitely doable. Uh, in terms of our residency program, I would say about half of us live on the beach side and then the other half of us live what we say over the ditch or uh, kind of on the same side as Mayo. Um, again, it's very, very easy to get to Mayo. Usually most of us live within 10 minutes of the hospital. So getting back and forth is not an issue at all. But just think about it. It may not be something that you guys have thought a lot about, but buying in Jacksonville is definitely doable. And to speak on the renting side, uh, for internal medicine residency, I've kind of just rented the whole time. And, you know, I'd say with Jacksonville, the cost of living is very reasonable. And I've never felt any, you know, financial pressure with that situation. I've had a one bedroom apartment that's over, you know, 1000 square feet. And it's been uh, extremely affordable. And that's even with uh, the rent going up 25%, which I think was a national trend about, you know, a year or two ago. So I think even with that, it's no concerns about affordability, especially compared to other Florida cities like Miami where or Tampa, where you're kind of paying a premium for that beach access on like Jacksonville. So uh, speaking of beach access, I think it we'd be remiss if we presented on resident life without highlighting one of the major draws of Jacksonville and what a lot of, you know, trainees here spend their time doing in their free time is, you know, accessing that beach. So, uh, you know, Jacksonville, the, the beaches can kind of the ones closest to Mayo are about five minutes away by car. Uh, there's three major beaches, which uh, are kind of more commercial. That's, you know, Atlantic, Nep Neptune and Jacksonville Beach. And then a little bit more south is Ponte Vedra Beach, which is a little bit more residential. And then uh, if you go farther north or south, maybe about a 30 minute drive, you'll get to these kind of nice, more naturalistic beaches. Uh, when you're out there, there's tons of stuff to do. Uh, a lot of people just go out there and walk. They'll bring their dogs for for 
can walk them as well. A lot of beach games are, are played around Jacksonville Beach. There's, you know, beach volleyball courts that are constantly having pickup games played there. And then surfing is also a big part of the the culture and the community here. It's a hobby I actually took up last summer and it's uh, I'm, I'm able to stand up on a board now after only, you know, a few attempts at trying. So it's actually easier than I thought it would be. But uh, there's actually a very big surfing community here because it's good for beginner surfers. The waves aren't too big uh, like they are. Can they, like they can sometimes be in the Pacific Ocean where they swallow you up. And uh, the water is actually a pretty reasonable temperature too, where you can go out a large portion of the year without needing a wetsuit or anything like that. So that's another big draw here. And then here I've included a couple more pictures in the middle of kind of some of those more natural beaches I'm talking about. Uh, at the top is a kind of a famous beach called Boneyard Beach, uh, where uh, dead trees essentially uh, wash off into the ocean and then are washed back on shore. And they have these carcasses that just litter the beach. And it's this very beautiful park that a lot of people like to go picnic, take pictures. And uh, at the bottom is Guana Beach, which is about 30 minutes south of uh, you know the hospital area. This is uh, actually situated uh, right off, off the coast of the Atlantic across from a preserve. And uh, here you'll just get that same beach experience, but have it be a lot more natural with a lot fewer people around as well. And then speaking of uh, restaurants and bars as well, Jacksonville is definitely a very underrated uh, food food city. I think I came from a, a Durham, North Carolina, which considers itself a foodie town, and I, I wasn't missing kind of much at all when I moved here. I think uh, in Jacksonville, you can find food from all sorts of different uh, ethnic groups and at all for all sorts of different uh, uh, health uh, interests as well. You can find vegan options. You can find tons of vegetar uh, vegetarian options as well. And uh, probably one of the highlights is seafood. Uh, there's very fresh uh, seafood avail available all over the city. Uh, here we have some pictures of you know residents eating pizza at the beach, eating sushi. Uh, one highlight is that uh, I think a few Fridays a month, I'm, I'm not sure if it's every Friday or just uh, every other or something, but uh, Mayo sponsors this event called Food Truck Friday where they, you know, uh, get these food trucks to come about campus. So instead of, you know, going to the normal cafeteria, you have the opportunity to, to get some delicious food truck uh, food. And this is one of our internal medicine teams just going as a group and our attending was luckily uh, was kind enough to buy us all, all shakes that day. And then Jacksonville also has a, a growing and very good uh, a brewery scene as well, if that's more your interest. Uh, entertainment is another big thing uh, in Jacksonville. Uh, in the top left, I kind of showed a picture that uh, encompasses the entertainment district that income that has the Jag Stadium, uh, Vistar Arena, where a lot of concerts and other uh, events take place. And they're actually planning to remodel this whole area in the coming years. So it'll be, uh, you know, brand new. Uh, the Jaguars are the professional football team that's here. They're very exciting because they have a, a, a lot of young talent and recently had a number one draft pick. Uh, at the top right, I have a picture of concert venues. We get major concerts here uh, every so often at that Vistar Arena downtown. At the bottom left, I'm showing some residents at a, a minor league baseball game. The team is the Jumbo Shrimp, and they uh, have a have a big following in this area. And bottom right, I just show one of the NFL games. All right, my slides are not advancing now. Okay, and the last sort of draw of Jacksonville is a kind of a vibrant art scene as well. Riverside is kind of the neighborhood within Jacksonville, uh, a little bit closer to downtown where a lot of the artistic presence is. Every Saturday morning, uh, there's a Riverside Arts Market that's located under one of their bridges where a lot of local artists and vendors just gather around and uh, will sell their wares. It becomes a pretty lively community. So that's a good thing to check out on weekends. There's also a couple of museums downtown, uh, a museum of science and history uh, called the Mosh and also the Cumber Museum that was referenced earlier. They have these very beautiful gardens in the back that kind of overlook the St. John's River. Those can be seen in that picture on the bottom right with a kind of manicured garden. And, you know, the bottom left actually shows Mayo's campus, which itself is kind of beautiful as well. And at Mayo, a lot of the residencies integrate uh, humanities curriculum where they kind of uh, try to teach residents and expose residents to some of this more artistic side of Jacksonville and show residents what it has to offer. 
intramural sports is a big thing in Jacksonville. Uh, we've had some teams going over the years. Uh, I'm not sure with what level of success compared to uh, other groups competing, but uh, at the top left is uh, one of the intramural basketball teams we had. Uh, we won't discuss what our record was. In the top, in the middle, though, we had a, had an intramural soccer team, which was actually pretty successful. I think they uh, won the trophy that year. And on the right was, a, I think, a kickball team. And uh, last but not least, I just wanted to introduce uh, this one group uh, at Mayo Clinic called the Mayo Fellows Association, or MFA. I'm actually the vice president of that organization and uh, uh, happy to represent it today. We basically serve as an advocacy group for residents and fellows, all trainees, and try to uh, advocate on their behalf. Some of the gains we've been able to get over the past years include expanding from 15 to 20 vacation days for all trainees, getting the meal stipend increase from $600 to $900 a year. So you don't have to think twice about getting that afternoon coffee to get through the day. And on top of that, MFAs, you know, their big role for a lot of people is just uh, sponsoring some social events where they kind of organize them and advertise them to the residents. So you can, you know, meet your fellow residents, no matter what their discipline is and without having to put forth too much effort yourself. So uh, these are the other members of MFA's executive board and, Hopefully, if you come here, we'll get to meet you. We also sponsor some events where we just have snack pickups and food pickups, some MFA beach days, and an MFA event at Top Golf where uh, with some anesthesia trainees. And uh, this is uh, uh, Jamie and my contact information. If you guys are interested, feel free to reach out to us with any questions, and we're happy to answer them and give that sort of trainee perspective. Well, thank you, Chiefs. Uh, I think that was a great representation of resident life uh, here on campus and living in Jacksonville. And having had been a resident uh, here at one time many years ago, I can attest to all the positivity and all the good things that you said. Um, and follow MFA on social media. They've got an Instagram account and one of our neurology residents helps to run that uh, account, Dr. Malati. So. All right, so thank you all for, to all of our speakers first uh, for joining us tonight and sharing the highlights of Mayo Clinic in Florida. Thank you to all of our guests and uh, don't, uh, <clears throat> don't leave yet because the best is yet to come. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little uh, bunch of squares at the bottom that say breakout rooms. So you should see an option for each one of our residency programs. So it's a choose your own adventure. I know you pre-registered for a program. So pick your, your program of interest and uh, hopefully you get to ask some questions and meet some leaders and, and residents in that program. Thanks everyone. Have a good night and thank you for joining us and best of luck to you in the 2024 match. <laughs>